Bizzle here. Welcome to ABC. Sorry, that's not the wrong. That's not the right channel. Totally <laughs> <laughs> channel. Here we go. Someone, someone's got too many YouTube channels. <laughs> Just too many things going on. Hi everyone, welcome to Anesthesia <laughs> Coffee Break. Uh, so my name is Lahir. I'm here with Stan. And, and I'm Stan. <laughs> And so, yes, um, this very special episode, we have Stuart Watson, who started Ketamine Nightmares. And Stan, I believe you're going to introduce Stuart for us. Yeah, absolutely. No, I was so excited to have uh, Stuart here today. And look, he needs absolutely no introduction, but I'll give one anyway. So winner of the Renton Prize in 2019 for the ANSCA primary exam, and really most famous for being the creator of Ketamine Nightmares, an amazing free educational resource that has really enhanced the learning curve for all primary trainees out there, including educators such as myself. And can I just say, we are so grateful, Stuart, for all the work that you've done and also that what you continue to do and also provide um, for all the ANSCA trainees out there. And, you know, thank you so much, Stuart. So Today, his efforts will be raising funds uh, for the Smith family. So I'll just put up the website there. Uh, it's a fantastic charity that helps disadvantaged uh, Aussie kids just create better future for themselves by helping out with their education. And today, Stuart will be talking about what does blood pressure really mean and why do we care about it? So without further ado, Stuart, I will hand over to you. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, Lahira. Welcome to everybody else who's attending as well. Um, I suppose I'm a little bit open as to how this might go. I mean, I've got my lecture slides here, which we can, I'm happy to talk through. It might be interesting to have a few conversations as well as, as we go. Um, we appreciate that this is you know, live streaming and therefore uh, it's going to be published on the internet. So if you don't feel comfortable with that, that's totally fine. We're not upset about it. But Equally, it would be great to have people commenting or asking questions. So if you want to bear about balaclava or put on an accent or put on a funky background or give yourself a pseudonym or any all of the above, then please do. Um, might things, make things more interesting too. Um, so the topic I've picked today is blood pressure. Uh, one thing that I really enjoy is picking a topic which appears bland or simple or straightforward and then trying to figure out what uh, details or interesting things can be mined from discussion about that topic. Um, so hence, hence this one. I've been wanting to make this into a Viva, uh, but I think it suits this kind of format too. So, so let's get started. So how do I scroll through this? Just yes. do I click? Actually, just this arrow here. This arrow here? No worries. Yeah. yeah. So the plan is to talk about blood pressure, uh, what it is, what determines it, why do we care about it, and go through a few clinical applications to, I guess, uh, marry the primary exam material up with real life that we um, that we see in front of us. In the operating theater. So starting with blood pressure itself, um, first question might be, what is pressure? And I'll just put it out to the audience or Lau or Stan, anybody feel oh, like because it's an, this one? Because it's an easy question. Yeah. For, I'm just gonna say it's a force per unit area. Yeah. Oh, no, I, oh, oh, damn it. I want question. <laughs> that's the last question I'm gonna answer. Okay, so. Love the enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah, so exactly, that, that's it, force per unit area. So. Um, I think this, this little gif here from the internet describes that quite neatly. So there's a hydraulic press, obviously a lot of force behind that. It's all um, going down to a single point, smashing those CDs to smithereens, which is fine because we don't use them anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, Meg's, Meg's right. It was a little bit choppy before, but I think it has to do with your uh, NBN, doesn't it? Yeah, I've just got a hotspot and uh, we'll ask that question again. So yeah, yeah she yeah. was just asking, what is blood pressure? So it's not a trick a, question. Go on. Oh, I would have a guess that... It, maybe it is a bit of a less than simple answer and I would divide my answer into what is systolic mean and diastolic because they all mean different things. Yeah. Um, so systolic pressure is the peak pressure during systole in the arterial system, mean arterial pressure, depends how you measure it, whether it's manual or air under the curve for an arterial trace. And then diastolic is the... I actually should think about how to define diastolic, but it's the pressure that's exerted by your vasculature during the diastolic phase. I sure. don't know if that's the right I answer. I can't fault your answer. Um, I was going somewhere a little bit further back. We will get to where you've been talking. But blood pressure, I mean, it's very simply, it's the same thing. It's, again, it's force per unit area, but in this case, it's exerted against the blood vessel walls as a result of fluid, cells, et cetera, um, you know, uh, making contact with those, with those walls. Um, so next... 
last question would be what determines blood pressure? What determines how high or low it is? I can have a go at this one. Sure. Um, so I would say that the key determinants of uh, blood pressure are cardiac output and uh, systemic vascular resistance. Yep, yep, very good. So we all know this one, mean arterial pressure equals cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. Um, and, I, and I feel like there's also this thing where it's the amount of volume in the system and the compliance of the system. Mm. So I feel like it's not only cardiac output, but it's input in, which is cardiac output, and then runoff. So two functions there, you have less runoff, you'll have more volume in the system. Yeah. Uh, which, Isn't that what SVR just describes there? Uh, I thought SVR describes the compliance state and then cardiac output is the input. Yeah. And that doesn't necessarily describe all the output. Mm. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Let, let's, let's see how <laughs> it looks from my out. point of view. <laughs> so that true. equation we described, I just want to pick that equation apart just for a minute. So a little, uh, little detour. Um, so this is, uh, as we all know, an application of Ohm's law, which is V equals I times R. Um, that is potential difference, current and, and um, resistance. In a hydraulic system, it's P1 minus P2, as in a pressure gradient is equal to the flow uh, multiplied by the resistance. Um, and if we pump in the, uh, or, or plug in the, um, the terms that we're used to using for this equation, it's mean arterial pressure will be P1, cardiac output will be Q, and SVR will be R. But what about P2? Anybody know what this one's supposed to be? There's something missing from this equation. The that, that's often right atrial pressure. pressure. Yeah, yeah, it should be right atrial pressure, or say CVP, yeah. So correct. So that's the, that's the first thing to, to mention is this, um, this equation that's drummed into us isn't, isn't quite there um, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it is in some sense true that the blood pressure is determined by the cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance, but uh, that's that if we're applying Ohm's law um, in a primary exam setting, I think that would be the, the way to answer that question. If we re re rearrange that equation, we get, we get this one. And I like this representation better because it describes kind of what we're thinking of. So the flow from uh, to a, in a particular direction is determined by the pressure gradient and the resistance, okay? Pressure gradient making it go faster, resistance making it go slower, so hence numerator and denominator respectively. Um, but then let me ask you this. Let's say we take a completely healthy patient and give them adenosine for no good reason. Let's say it's a good dose, 12 milligrams, and we induce asystole. In that patient, cardiac output is instantaneously zero. Does that not mean that the blood pressure is zero? So we have zero on the left side of the equation and, and therefore is it zero on the right? Okay. How, 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 can the, how can these both be true? So, and correspondingly, let's say we have a patient in cardiac arrest uh, whose cardiac output is zero. And let's say miraculously, we suddenly get a cardiac output of five liters per minute after successful defibrillation. Does the patient then re regain consciousness straight away on account of blood pressure returning to normal? Well, we all know these things aren't true, um, you know, intuitively, but let's just think about why that is. And we can do that using one of these diagrams. So just orientate you, that's the heart up the top. Um, that's the, um, I guess, tissues down the bottom or the, the systemic vascular resistance at that level with arterioles and tissues and venules. On the right-hand side of the screen in red is arteries, systemic arteries. On the, on the left-hand side of the screen is systemic veins. And we've got to pretend as well uh, for the purposes of this diagram, that there's no such thing as the right circulation. Okay, so this is um, more or less the artificial setup that was used by I think Arthur Guyton and his colleagues um, doing, doing those experiments from, that derived, from which he derived from, uh, Venus, Venus return curves and things. So this is our diagram. Let's work with it for now. Um, and so in our patient who we give adenosine, we induce cardiac standstill. Cardiac output is now zero. There is in fact blood still flowing from the arterial to the venous circulation. That is from the right of the screen to the left uh, because there is blood pressure. And then what happens? Well, the blood starts to exit the arteries across the tissues to the veins we have a reduction in the arterial volume. And eventually the blood pressure falls corresponding, with, corresponding to that reduction in volume. And so tissue, um, uh, tissue flow falls too. Of course, this is very short lived with adenosine, so it doesn't matter, but that's what's happening. And likewise, in an arrested setting, uh, we have a patient whose arteries are essentially empty, or at least we would say that the pressure inside the arteries is the mean systemic filling pressure. So seven millimeters of mercury, roughly on both the arterial and the venous sides, as we recall, Venous capacitance is, is, is very large. It's sort of 19 times greater than, uh, than arterial. So all the blood's in the veins, there's almost none in the arteries. And if we suddenly jumpstart the heart, we get a cardiac output of five liters per minute, but the patient doesn't wake up straight away. The arteries are still empty at that point in time. It takes time for the blood to be shuttled from the venous circulation back into the arterial circulation. 
And only at some point later do we have a return in tissue flow as a result of blood being in the arteries, exerting a pressure and passing across these tissues. So based on what we've just discussed, we can say then that blood pressure is determined by the amount of, and this, this is tying uh, this, the physiological determinants in with the physical determinants that Lars just mentioning before, is proportional to the amount of blood in the pipes and the stretchiness of the pipes. That's it. That's what blood pressure fundamentally is. Um, and, it, it, and that otherwise stated, that's volume on compliance. But what about these physiological determinants? How do we tie in this amount of blood, blood in the pipes, stretchiness of the pipes with cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance? Because we all know that equation, you know, it's fairly rock solid at this point. So how do we tie those in together? Here's how I think we can do it. Um, so this is a, you know, just an, uh, a representation of the whole arterial system. We've got an amount of blood and stretchiness of the vessels, which both determine the blood pressure. But the blood is not static. Blood is flowing in and flowing out. So inflow is, is of course, cardiac output. Outflow uh, is technically called peripheral runoff, um, total peripheral runoff. Let's call it tissue blood flow just because it's more descriptive for our purposes. And the rate of tissue blood flow is determined by, well, oddly enough, the blood pressure, but also the systemic vascular resistance. There is a circularity in this, uh, in this, um, this concept of blood pressure, wherein you know, one kind of pressure decides the next kind of pressure. Excuse me, I've skipped ahead a couple. So we have the cardiac output, which determines the blood pressure, which determines the venous pressure, which determines the cardiac output, and it goes round and round and round. But this is the schematic here. So we have cardiac output on the left, tissue blood flow on the right, systemic vascular resistance. So we have these physical determinants, which are given rise to by physiological determinants. So here's another way to describe it. We have physical determinants of blood pressure, which is technically the amount of blood in the arteries. It's not a volume, but of course, fluids are not really compressible. So let's just say volume and compliance and the physiological determinants, which are cardiac output and SVR, these are things which determine how much blood is in the pipes. These are your inflow and outflow determinants. So that's, what's, that's, what, that's what creates blood pressure. Um, compliance, to be clear, this is not the same thing as SVR. So the arterioles have variable tone, which gives rise to the systemic vascular resistance, not just the arterioles, but it's mostly them. Um, and but the compliance is said to be something which is like an intrinsic property of the arteries themselves. And this is very much age dependent. So um, you've probably seen these compliance curves in your physiology books, or you've certainly seen this in real life. You have the older person who's got a massive pulse pressure because the vessels are just not, not stretchy. And probably they end up with a particular blood pressure at a lower arterial volume if, if you have less compliant pipes. So this is a fixed phenomenon. It changes, not fixed. It's fixed in the sense that we cannot modify it with drugs or, or we certainly can't modify it minute to minute, uh, but it, it's very much dependent on age. One thing I was a bit disturbed to learn as I was reading some textbooks in preparation for this talk is that my arterial compliance is a lot less now at the age of 32 than what it was when I was even 24. So <laughs> there were some unfortunate experiments where they did autopsies of um, people of various ages and determined their arterial compliance with physical experiments. And at the age of 20 to 24, it's just, it's just monstrous how, how stretchy and, and elastic the vessels are. And even in your 30s, it's not as good. And then just gets worse, worse and worse after that. But what is it, the um, ages where the soft things go hard and the hard things go soft? <laughs> or something like that. Something like that. <laughs> something like that. Lots we've got to look forward to. Okay, back to where we were. Uh, now, one of, our, one, of our, one of our callers in was just talking about systolic and diastolic pressure. So let's revisit, let's, let's go back to that now. So, so far, we've been talking about the determinants of mean arterial pressure. But of course, we have a pulsatile circulation. Uh, we have a pump which pumps intermittently, not continuously. And so we have a systolic and a diastolic pressure. So then knowing what we know about the physio physical and physiological determinants of mean pressure, what determines systolic pressure or for that matter, diastolic pressure? Anyone have a go? That's good because I don't so, know the answer either. Oh, oh okay. Tell, tell me. Perhaps you know something. If you don't know the answer, I don't want to have a go. <laughs> oh, no, L, 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 I want you to have a go. Just yeah, to... We, 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 we might learn something. Well, I guess systolic blood pressure in my mind would be dictated by what's happening in your left ventricle during systole, um, which is determined by preload, contractility and afterload, um, which determines the degree of your systolic blood pressure. I don't think I have a better definition than that. And then the diastolic would be all those things that you kind of talked about, the, the compliance of your blood vessels and the force that they exert during diastole on that circulating blood volume. I think that's the best yep. way I think about it. Yeah, I think this is the understanding that most of us would tend to have. But 
Here's another way to look at it. Let's, try, let's just ask yourself perhaps an easier question that's determinants of pulse pressure. So with pulse pressure, something is happening between the bottom and the top, between the diastolic uh, pressure and the systolic pressure um, that must be accounted for by those physical determinants which we mentioned before. So during this rapid ejection phase in systole, remember that it's, that it's not the whole of systole, um, there will be a change in the amount of blood in the arterial circulation and there will be a relationship between that and the stretchiness or the compliance, as we know the compliance doesn't change, not minute to minute, that determines the pulse pressure. And so this amount, of course, uh, results from an inflow and an outflow because it's a continuously you know, moving circulation. Um, the inflow, we can think of that as stroke volume. The outflow, we can, there's not really a good term for this, but let's just say systolic runoff, which means that as the, pump, as the LV has pumped an amount of blood into the arterial circulation, some amount of blood will also be leaving the arterial circulation. And that gives us our change in volume during, during uh, uh, the rapid ejection phase. Stretchiness is, of course, compliance. Now, I've got stars on stroke volume and systolic runoff because, of course, it's not really the whole of systole, right? Systole is longer than the rapid ejection phase, which gives rise to your pulse pressure. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of good enough, you know? Um, so therefore, we can just say, because, what have I done here? Yeah, so here might be the, the most correct way to talk about it. Um, yeah, I think down the bottom is okay. It's okay. Yeah. yeah, most of my things are in the middle. It's great. So yeah, pulse pressure will be proportional to rapid ejection minus early systolic runoff divided by compliance. It's a bit of a mouthful, um, but the I think the good news is we can think of it as being more or less stroke volume divided by compliance. Now this does kind of mean that the the, you know, the cardiac output or the stroke volume has more to do with the systolic pressure than the relative to the diastolic pressure. But I don't think it's quite true to think of the diastolic pressure is being determined by the SVR because we've talked about the determinants of blood pressure at any point in the cycle. It's all about volume and volume and compliance, and the volume is only going to arrive there by the um, by the pumping of the uh, pumping action of the heart. Um, so I think that to me there are determinants of mean pressure and there are determinants of pulse pressure, but the systolic and the diastolic are just the uppermost and the lowermost oscillations about that mean pressure, resulting from the resulting from the pulse. So you might you might have a you know a very fast heart rate and a low stroke volume uh, at the extremes of that equation you get you know bypass where there's no pulse pressure you just get a mean pressure only but i i struggle to understand to to i guess articulate exactly what the determinants the determinants are of systolic pressure or diastolic pressure individually more it's more that to me that they result from the mean pressure plus the pulse pressure either wise in the, either in the up or the or the down direction um, so i'd be keen to get input from la or stan if you thought more about this I think this is a bit of a contentious issue. So you might, um, I'm not sure what examiners all think about this. I got asked this question in a practice fiver um, before my primary exam. And I was trying to, I guess, think through all of this on the spot and it's taken me a little while to go through it later. But I think I said something along these lines and the examiner, I don't think agreed. Um, in, certain, in some of their textbooks that will speak of you know, diastolic pressure being more determined by say vascular resistance as such. Hmm. But I'm not convinced that's the case. And it, but if you guys can fault the, line of reasoning that i've just put forth and no like i, I definitely would i definitely wouldn't fault it as, as in and when i think of you know blood pressure it sounds like just one word whereas a cardiac cycle uh, involves multiple changes to that volume we're talking about so say blood pressure is volume over your compliance or you know, the stretchiness at any given point and once you have a, you know the systole like you l was even mentioning you've got this influx of blood which changes the volume state which then over time and interdiastole stabilizes with you know runoff and the loss of that uh, loss of that cyst uh, systolic extra volume and so i feel like if i just keep referring it back to amount over uh, amount over compliance that allows for my understanding of what that volume is doing through the entire cardiac cycle mm -hmm. i think I, I feel like i don't need too much more than that does that make sense to me mm -hmm. um but yeah i i mean I, I think i completely agree with uh the, yeah. the premise here yeah yeah okay i mean another I, way I'm, to look at it is i've, I've got a stand please go ahead oh yeah you know i've got a i've got a thought on this and that mm -hmm. uh i think that you know with pulse pressure the way that you presented it, I think it's it's really um, nice and elegant in terms of that formula and that idea uh, with regards to both what's being ejected from the heart versus what's being run off, and I and I think that but I think there needs to be a little. I mean, I feel like there needs to be another layer of complexity to it because you know, let's say hypothetically you've got a pulse pressure of you know no, normally let's say a pulse pressure of you know forty or fifty. 
that base can actually change. So let's say your normal blood pressure is 120 on 80 or 120 on 70. You know, you could have the same sort of pulse pressure, but it could be a much at a higher, at a higher systolic, you know, let's say 160 uh, systolic versus 110 yeah. diastolic, but still have the same sort of pulse pressure, yeah. which means that I guess it adds another layer of complexity to the idea that there has to be something that affects both as well. So I think that there are things that affect each one separately and also things that affect both uh, equally as well to um, result in those changes. But you're, but you're right, it, it is very, very complex. And look, one of, one of my favorite questions is, you know, when we think about afterload, and I think Elle sort of touched on this before when she was having a chat um, in her answer, when we think about afterload, like which one of those pressures represents afterload um, the best? Is it systolic, mean, or diastolic? Now, we don't answer that I've question. Always, really. We just say SVR. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, yeah. You just say SVR, absolutely. Which is what most people say. And look, well, I, I've had a thought about this because against, I, the past pumping against. against <laughs> no, but yeah, but but you know, when you think about the definition of afterload, which is the um, impedance to um, left ventricular ejection, which happens just prior to systole, for me, it it sounds as if systolic blood pressure actually represents afterload the best. And you know the the idea of uh, the ejection velocity or things that can affect the ejection velocity will affect your systolic blood pressure versus um, not so much your diastolic pressure. Uh, Sam, I, I, I mean, can I can I do yeah. a contr contrary onto that? So I thought afterload is the you know a, a force uh, against which the left ventricle contracts, and so the left ventricle contracts in systole. Systole occurs just after di diastole. So in my mind. The, the, the thing that contributes to the force with, against which your left ventricle contracts is represented mostly by the diastolic pressure? Uh, so it de depends, on your, depends on your definition. So I think there are some okay. definitions out there which says pri just prior to ventricular ejection. So which means it's, it's just at the end of, just at, so you're at the end of diastole and you're starting to- You mean at the end now. of isovalimic limit contraction, Stan? <laughs> oh, yeah. you're right. Yeah, it's like yes. It's at the end of isolation. Yes. contraction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there and, is a systolic and so, pressure there. Yeah. yeah. So if you were to peek yeah. outside the aortic valve at that point in time, you'd see diastolic pressure. Yeah. Yeah. But then what it has to generate to actually get that blood out has to be has to be represented by your systolic blood pressure. In other words, if there is if there is a lot of impedance to the flow, you will see that. Um, resulted in a much higher yeah. systolic blood pressure. I mean, th that, that's just my thought in terms of, you know, factors that can increase afterload. And I guess that um, when we think about factors that increase afterload, <clears throat> naturally we do think of a higher systolic blood pressure, don't we? And so what Stuart's saying, uh, say, think of w Wigger's diagram, it's just at that point before the, uh, before the right, rise of systolic system. Yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> but it all does come down to definitions, right? So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And and look, I, I think you know, I think um, Papano does say, yeah, it is it is represented by the aortic pressure, um, and and the left ventricular pressure. I think during the ejection during the ejection phase of the cardiac cycle, and and look, that that's all he says. He doesn't actually say whether it's systolic or diastolic. But I've just made the inference. I think because of that memory that it's during the ejection phase of the left ventricle that uh, it yeah. probably most correlates best with systolic. But it's such, a, it's such an interesting idea. And you know, I, I think it's, as you said, up for discussion. It's tricky, isn't it? Because the, the for, for whatever it is that the LV is pumping against is not a, stat, it's not a static thing. Mm. So it's hard to give it a yep. name. Yep. Anyways, all good talking points. Sorry, um, can I just say something? Wouldn't it be better to define it as like a transmural pressure and then it doesn't matter whether it's systole or diastole? Sure. Because then it's just- yeah, That's kind of my get out of free jail card too with that kind of definition. Yeah, but I guess we're talking about what does that correspond to? But you're right, yeah. That's a good way to answer the question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, oh, we might just leave that one there. That's, that's, that's a good talking point, but yeah. I think- uh, I don't think I can um, shed any further light on that one necessarily, Stan. We're left with a few questions there. No, oh, that's fine. Always, always interesting. Yeah, no, I think this is fantastic. Really, uh, really sort of good uh, discussion points. No worries. Okay, let's go to the next topic, which is 
why do we care so much about blood pressure? Um, who's got an answer for this? Because it because it correlates with perfusion of um, uh, tissue. Yep. So blood pressure determines blood flow. Why do we care about blood flow? Well, ultimately, from my point of view, it's, it's just about perfusion. So it's about oxygen arriving at tissues where it's needed and waste products being removed. Yeah, that's and right. So waste products, yes, but oxygen delivery fundamentally is what we're concerned yeah, with yeah. here, isn't it? That's right. Okay, so let's look at oxygen delivery for a moment. So oxygen delivery is, of course, determined by cardiac output and oxygen content. Cardiac output has determinants, which we all well know. Likewise, oxygen content is determined by, I guess, capacity and saturation. Uh, we also should, also should mention at this point that it's not just about oxygen delivery, but adequacy of oxygen delivery, that is delivery in relation to consumption. And consumption likewise has um, variables that we can sometimes adjust and, and certainly need to be accounted for. And we might actually mention those just for the uh, podcast listeners, uh, if you want to go through. Oh, sure. Yeah. So cardiac output determinants will be preload, afterload, rate and contractility. Um, those things which determine oxygen content is essentially hemoglobin and SAT slash PaO2. I know this, the, the other small ball things, but that, that's more or less it. And as far as um, oxygen demand, um, this is specific to each organ, but with respect to the heart, we would have, broadly speaking, basal, electrical and mechanical factors. We can further subdivide those, of course. Uh, and for the brain, it will be basal and electrical factors. These are, I've just mentioned these ones here because it's, it's good to think of this in relation to um, oxygen delivery, and these will be organs that we'll be bringing up a bit later on when we talk about applications. Um, anyways, my question to you is, and question to the audience is, where is blood pressure in these determinants in, these, in this equation? <laughs> Can anyone see blood pressure? You know, the, the best you might be able to say, I suppose, is that you know blood pressure has something to do with cardiac output, but it's really cardiac output determining blood pressure rather than the other way around, isn't it? So. Um, so here is, I think, what is going on here. Mm -hmm. um, so, so far, returning to our diagram, so with heart up the top, tissues down the bottom, arteries on the right, veins on the left, um, flow in a cl clockwise direction. We have been talking about cardiac output as being the flow of interest or the location of flow of interest. But I put it to you that we should perhaps be talking about tissue blood flow instead, at least in this setting. And my reasons for this would be in relation to Ohm's law. If we were to apply it purely, we always say that flow occurs from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure across a resistance. That is from the arterial circulation to the venous circulation across the systemic vascular resistance. And so this flow is of course, of course occurring across the tissues, not across the heart. And so if we put in the, uh, the terms that we should be using here, MAP on the right, CVP on the left, blood flowing from right to left across the systemic vascular resistance at the tissues or the arterioles that precede the tissues. Perhaps our equation should look a bit more like this. Um, of course, tissue blood flow is numerically identical to cardiac output, but it, using the wrong term in a particular application of Ohm's law, I think can lead to some confusion and misunderstanding, which I'll, I'll explain a little, um, a little further ahead. So instead of this equation, maybe we should be using this equation here. Um, so tissue blood flow equals mean arterial pressure time, uh, uh, minus CVP or RAP divided by the systemic vascular resistance. Um, and so now it starts to look a little different with our, if we return to our determinants of oxygen delivery, it's tissue blood flow times oxygen content. And tissue blood flow has quite different determinants um, to the terms of cardiac output. And here we would say, well, again, it's pressure gradient resistance. So it's mean arterial pressure, um, central venous pressure or right atrial pressure and SVR. So here blood pressure does figure in this, in this um, if we look at the determinants in this way. And I would say further that we're not necessarily always concerned with total tissue blood flow, but tissue flow to particular organs with uh, very specific requirements if they're going to survive and if the rest of the body is going to survive. And so we might say again, organ blood flow multiplied by oxygen content for oxygen delivery to that particular organ. Now, there are various determinants of organ blood flow. For most organs, it looks something like this, just simply a ratio of perfusion pressure to vascular resistance. That's how it kind of is for the kidneys, but it's a bit different for the brain where we start to care about things like ICP and it's certainly different for the heart where perfusion time, that is time spent in diastole, at least for the um, flow to the, through the left main coronary artery, that starts to become important too. So that's what I would have to say about oxygen delivery. Now with all those things in mind, let's go through a few applications. The first one is the role of vasopressors. Um, so here's something you might see, I think we, from time to time, you might hear somebody say, well, 
the way vasopressors raise blood pressure is by vasoconstriction, which reduces radius. And we know from the Hagen-Poisson equation that uh, radius is uh, raised to the power of four on the denominator. And therefore any reduction in the radius dramatically reduces the flow rate through an organ. So with that in mind, is not uh, the administration of vasopressors a bad idea if we wanted to preserve blood flow and therefore tissue oxygenation? Anyone got an advance on this? How would you respond to that, you know, uh, to that argument? Well, I would say that we would only be using it if the blood pressure was low. You're not using it in somebody who's got a normal blood pressure because then you would reduce flow. Okay, yep. Let's look um, at the question. I, I, yep. I'll go, go for it, Meg. Yeah. No, that's okay, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Stan have a go. Oh, no, no, you go, you go, Meg. Yeah. So I'd say it's, in, um, or at least my understanding is that because it's increasing the systemic vascular resistance, it's almost kind of like holding blood in the arterial side of the circulation and yes. therefore increasing um, the blood pressure by increasing the volume of blood in the arterial circ circulation, which does increase um, organ blood, blood flow. Yep. Okay. I'll, I'll pay that. Let me try to um, make that a little, little crisper. Well, I've, so, I, I, just, I have always struggled with this idea yeah. in that. It's a funny Surely one, it? it's we're reducing flow to some pretty important organs. Like, I don't know how you determine that. And in my mind, the only solution to all of this is to figure out how to get tissue perfusion measurements, which we don't have. But, but we have, um, we have um, that's, I was going to say, that's such a good question. Like you, you're thinking about, or oh, this is the way that I think about this is in your, you're thinking about which organ do you want to perfuse right. the most or which organ is the most important. And for me, you know, under anesthesia, it's always just the heart and the brain. And so I think when I think about that, that's why vasopressors make sense. As in, because when we think about vaso or total peripheral vasoconstriction, the, the organ flow to the heart doesn't care about. In fact, it's beneficial to have, um, you know, vasoconstriction, uh, systemic vasoconstriction for, the, for uh, perfusion to the heart, which happens in diastole. And for the brain, we know we know how the brain works. The, the brain the brain controls its own blood flow as long as you're using propofol. Yeah, but that, but those are you know those are sort of my thoughts on that. That you know we we I guess we think about it in terms of which organ um, is really sort of important when we think about the use of vasopressors. But um, yeah, I think that that that's for me why vasoconstriction is helpful. But yeah, I want to hear your thoughts, uh, Stuart. Yeah, so here's the way I'd, I'd go about explaining it. I would say all circulations are not the same. So let's take the example of sepsis, right? So we know what this is. It's a high cardiac output state, low systemic vascular resistance state, fast flow, lots of uh, vasodilatory nasties. And we're going to assume for the moment this is a pure vasodilatory state. We're not going to take into account the loss of intravascular volume. We're not going to take into account septic cardiomyopathy, just a vasodilatory state. So in this sort of patient, we have blood going through all sorts of different organs. Um, the the um, arteries and, and the arteries that supply these organs are not necessarily the same. So we've got brain, we've got heart. These are very auto-regulated circulations. We've got other circulations like the splanchnic and the mucocutaneous circulations, which are very, very alpha-1 sensitive, that is um, sensitive to catecholamines or, or vasopressors of other kinds. Um, and so when we give a you know, say, let's just say a pure vasopressor or, or something which is almost as good as that. So let's just say it's noradrenaline or phenylephrine. What we're doing is we're reducing the flow to the non-vital organs, those organs which have very high expression of alpha-1 adrenoceptors, to those organs which do not care about the action of catecholamines much. So yes, there are adrenoceptors on the coronary or cerebral circulations, but metabolic and myogenic autoregulation are much, much, much more important to determining vessel tone in those vascular beds. Um, so overall, in if we give these vasopressor, we increase systemic vascular resistance. Interestingly enough, we actually reduce cardiac output because that's what happens. You know, if if you reduce, uh, we're increasing afterload, aren't we? So we reduce the cardiac output, we reduce the flow, but um, the blood starts to return back to the arterial circulation because of our higher SVR, our um, greater restriction on outflow from the arterial circulation. Um, we have correspondingly an increase in flow rate through these important organs and a massive reduction in flow rate through these less important organs, or at least the organs which aren't important in the, in the short term. So we reach a new equilibrium with a higher SVR than before, probably not normal, but higher than before. We, our new equilibrium also has a lower cardiac output, 
probably not as low as normal, but certainly lower than what we had before. And uh, you would normally think that the low cut, lower cardiac output is a bad thing, but it all, determine, it all depends on where that cardiac output is going. Um, we all, and we might remember from our um, reading of the primary syllabus that the uh, blood, vessel, blood cir uh, circulations like the skin have an enormous capacity to modulate their flow. Like is it something like 30 times um, up, up and down, or is it, I think it's 10 times up and three times down, something like that. Um, likewise, muscles can accommodate an enormous amount of blood uh, in an exercising person, in an exercising subject. So um, there's a, a huge capacity for these circulations to modulate the, the degree of flow that goes through them. And so that to me is the role of vasopressors. They're redirecting flow from a less important area to a more important area. Overall, we have less total flow because SVR is higher. That's the whole point of the drugs. We have more flow through essential organs uh, because these organs are subject to myogenic and metabolic water regulation. And so they, the radius of these vessels is not reducing. It's staying the same. It's probably higher than normally, if anything, if they're, if they're starving for oxygen. And we certainly and we have a much lesser degree of flow through these non-essential organs as a result of them, them generally being very sensitive to um, alpha-1 agonists. Is that... Flesh that out a little bit further for for that purposes of that discussion. Yeah. Okay, that's, let's let's go to another example. Excellent summary. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's the way I see it, anyways. So I want to go through two scenarios. These are both quite real scenarios, uh, and the 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 theme here is application of the determinants of oxygen delivery, essentially, or supply and demand in some cases. So let's say this patient is day two post CAGS for triple vessel disease. This patient's languishing a little bit in the ICU, still intubated. They've got a bit of chest sepsis. They've got a little bit of NORAD requirement. Okay, and um, their numbers are looking okay. You know, mean pressures, I think it was probably a little bit higher than that because that perfusion pressure is not looking so good, is it? But the, the SATs are, you know, middling. Um, the SATs are something like mid, mid 90% on FI2 so, of something reasonable. So MAP is about 65, CVP 15, SATs 95 on an FI of 0.4. Yep, yep, thanks, love. And so as the evening wears on, this patient becomes febrile, temperature is 38 and a half, becomes tachycardic uh, in association with this sepsis, heart rate of 120, and the SATs are falling a bit. You've got SATs of 99% on uh, FiO2 of basically one. Uh, and the noradrenaline requirement starts to go up suddenly quite a lot. And a bedside echo, although the pictures aren't very good, so it shows that the LV is looking um, not very happy at all. Mm. So the question is, I'm gonna give you two options. One is dobutamine, the other one is nitric oxide. Nitric. Yeah, that's the correct answer, but why? The problem's the heart. Well, I think the problem's the, the heart rate, which is you don't get um, perfusion and diastole. Yeah. So it's the fever. So you'd give, I'd give paracetamol and yeah. some nitrous. Good idea too. On top of that fever. So yes, yeah, so it didn't occur to me at the beginning. I thought, look, this is a revascularized heart. How can this heart be ischemic? But I think that was what was happening. Um, Cause this very clever ICU registrar who's on with me that, that evening, um, I think uh, she didn't say as much, but I think this is what, what her thought process was. So the nitric was given, um, or going back a step, the reason for the problem is that sepsis is reducing supply and increasing demand. So we have um, a patient who's probably a bit anemic. Uh, they've certainly got a decreasing SATs. Uh, they've got a reduction in coronary flow because of their tachycardia and also the, the hypotension that was, it, that was resulting from the, set, from the sepsis and the myocardial dysfunction. Uh, they've also got increased demand. So they've got a higher temperature. So they've got a higher basal metabolic rate. The heart's doing more mechanical work. It's doing more electrical work. And so this, all of this is a recipe for ischemia. And that uh, enters, put, the, puts the patient into a death spiral because, spiral because the, we then get negative inotropy. We then get hypotension. Of course, that further reduces the, uh, the supply. Um, so yeah, so yeah hyper hypertension is, uh, is the last link in that chain there. So the role of nitric here is to um, increase the oxygenation of, well, the whole circulation, but particularly that perfusing the heart, allow things to settle down. And after the nitric went on, the patient's noradrenaline requirement plummeted. It was quite remarkable what, how this worked. And so the point I'm getting at here is blood pressure is an extraordinarily important determinant of organ perfusion and um, tissue delivery to organs. But there's lots of other things we can do to modulate the supply um, oxygen supply demand ratio a, a relationship with the heart. You know, we can give more oxygen by by various means. We can use, give nitrodilators. We can give opioids to reduce heart rates or beta blockers to reduce contractility and, and heart rate by by similar means. We give red seals to increase the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. We can do balloon pumps. There's all manner of things we can which we can do. So it's 
in the, in the setting that an organ is ischemic, it's always good to think about things more than the blood pressure. And I would say more even uh, than, and more than perfusion pressure, because of course it's not just blood pressure, it's mean pressure divide, uh, minus CVP or aortic root pressure minus LV EDP in the case of the, in the, in the case of the LV. And when I think about a lot of these, uh, you know, concepts as well, the fact that not, it's, it's not always linear either, uh, you know, like to say the solution of a beta blocker up to a certain point, it is good. And then too slow mm. is bad or red cells. You know, there's a, there's a point where you know, 80 is probably fine for most patients or hundred, you know, if they're um, is ischemic, but then, uh, you know, more is thicker, better, uh, thicker blood. Mm. So more, you know, rheological problems and viscosity and less is not enough red cell carriage. So a lot of these things, again, complex, and there's so many multifaceted things that we're trying to make sense to through some uh, relatively simple equations, but really it is super complex. And I love the pattern recognition that you guys were just doing there, which is you see this, you know, you see this uh, pattern of things, you go, well, nitric is now the solution mm. to this. It's analogous to multimodal analgesia, I think what you've been describing. A certain amount of something mm. is good, too much is, uh, is detrimental. That's right, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Styling curve type thing as well. Yeah. Yeah. We see the same themes all throughout medicine. It's quite interesting, mm. really. So that's how that's, that situation looked to me. Um, um, and the last one we'll go through is this is a patient having a carotid endarterectomy. So this is an 80 year old patient uh, with the usual set of comorbidities undergoing this procedure. Um, was not able to have it awake, uh, which is the way it's often done where I work, uh, but because of a language barrier. And uh, I think her particular neurological deficit was affecting her ability to communicate too, if I remember correctly. In any case, this was a patient under GA, uh, the surgeons placed a clamp and all of a sudden the patient developed a massive ischemic response and a reduction in, um, in her near so, um, cerebral oximetry essentially. Um, we then had the, the, the surgeons of course placed a shunt and it was a little bit concerning because this made absolutely no difference to the blood pressure or the nears. So then the question was, well, what do we do now? Well, the answer was we did everything. So we reduced the um, metabolic demand of the, of the cells by increasing the propofol from three to six. It probably would have been a good idea to, to use SIVO as well because that actually induces some um, you know, inappropriate vasodilation, which can be a good thing. We increased the FIO2 from half to one. Uh, we did some hyperventilation of this patient, paralyzed patient uh, from 40 to 50 to again encourage some luxury perfusion. Reminded this is a, this is a lax brain, not a tight brain. We turned the bear hugger off to make sure we weren't overheating the patient. We checked the hemoglobin, that was good enough. Um, and I think it was not necessarily in this order. I think it was at the point where we increased the probe from some three to four to five to six. That was when we had resolution of this ischemic, meta, uh, this ischemic hemodynamic response and an increment in the nears. So that, that, uh, this was, um, for, to my mind, a really good application of um, supply demand determinants for the brain as well. So what do we do here? We, again, addressed all, all aspects. So we increased the, um, well, increasing blood flow by allowing, um, I guess, hypertension and not trying to control that hypertension. Although, as I remember, I think the REMI was on something like eight. It just tells you about the, uh, just how impervious the central ischemic response is to any drug that we can give. Mm. Um, we made sure the content of the uh, oxygen content was adequate. Uh, we've tried to reduce um, oxygen demand by the brain um, by giving these, uh, by giving hypnotics. And all of that res uh, caused resolution of the ischemic response. Um, and an increment in the nears back to, to what was the patient's normal. So again, if we review all the, um, if we re review the things that we can do in order to improve um, the supply demand relationship for the brain, it's not just about blood pressure. It's not even about ICP, but certainly not in this patient's case, although ICP can be the, the, the most important factor in a patient with a tight brain, of course, but we can increase oxygenation. We can induce luxury perfusion by hyperventilating the patient or changing from propofol to SIVO. We can make sure there's a, enough of a hemoglobin and we can make the patient hypothermic. So once again, um, blood pressure is not always the most important thing. In a patient who's um, been put on deep hypothermic circulatory arrest, that patient has a blood pressure of zero, but their supply demand relationship is adequate, at least for the near term, because their temperature is just so low uh, and the metabolic rate of the brain is just so low that half an hour can be withstood without, without too much damage or, really, or technically without any damage, um, mm. absent all the other factors in a patient on DHCA. So I'll just put a few summary slides in just to remind us of, all the, of a few of those key points that we've been talking about. Starting with blood pressure, the first thing I would say is that blood pressure equals the amount of blood divided by the stretchiness of the vessels or volume divided by compliance. And this applies to both mean pressure and to pulse pressure. The relationship between this equation and systolic and diastolic pressure is less straightforward as far as I'm concerned, 
but I can see that there are arguments other um, other ways, and and people will disagree about that about that particular point. Um, there are physiological and physical determinants of blood pressure. The physical determinants are those that we're seeing on screen. The physiological determinants are the cardiac output and the systemic vascular resistance, and these are things which determine the inflow and the outflow, and therefore the amount of blood in the arterial circulation. The second take home message is that tissue blood flow equals perfusion pressure divided by vascular resistance. Again, this varies a little bit depending on the organ, um, but this can be applied for both tissue, total, uh, or global tissue blood flow and also organ specific blood flow. Um, the equation mean arterial pressure equals cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance is instructive, uh, but I don't think it's perfect application of Ohm's law. Um, technically, the flow is occurring across the tissues dependent upon that tissue, uh, that pressure gradient between arteries and veins across the systemic vascular resistance. And thirdly, the role of vasopressors is to redirect blood flow from organs which are less essential in the immediate term to those which are essential um, and life-sustaining in the immediate term. Um, and they do this by raising the systemic vascular resistance, um, greatly reducing flow in those less important organs and increasing flow in those more important organs, even though total organ flow and total cardiac output is reduced compared with what it was before the administration of the pressor. With regard to oxygen delivery, uh, the first thing to say is that there are multiple determinants of oxygen delivery, uh, and this can be organ specific as well. We have the flow rate, we have perfusion time, we have capacity, we have saturation, and all of these things can be modulated in our patients with tenuous supply demand relationships. The second point is that there's multiple markers. So we all know this and when we're going about, um, going about our jobs, when we're reviewing patients on the ward, we don't just look at the blood pressure, we look at the other vital signs, we ask if the patient's out of breath, we look at the patient's conscious state, we see if the patient has angina or ischemic changes in ECG, we look at skin perfusion time, uh, skin, skin perfusion markers like capillary refill time, we look at urine output, and if we've got the ability to do so, we look at um, blood markers like lactate and central venous sats or mixed venous sats if we're lucky enough to have a pulmonary artery catheter in our patient. These are all use, very useful markers of the adequacy of oxygen supply demand relationship uh, within the patient. And so we should take account of all of these things when we're looking at our patients um, uh, and when we're caring for our patients, as well as just blood pressure. And the, correspondingly, patients are not all the same. So the 20 year old with extraordinarily compliant blood vessels and a great thumping left ventricle and, and a hemoglobin of 160 um, has, is in a completely different situation if he or she is to become hypotensive as compared with the elderly you know, anemic patient with LV failure. So, um, it's just as important to know about these determinants as it is to know about how they apply to this particular patient and whether this is a patient who is more robust or whose supply demand relationships are a little bit more tenuous. Anyways, that's all I had to say about blood pressure. <laughs> I'm keen to have further questions or discussion points raised if, if you guys think there's something I've gotten wrong or something that we've missed. Oh, that's great, Stuart. And what I love about that is that I think that's the deepest dive on blood pressure that I've seen. And it's actually just really, really good to go into that detail as we think about this every single day when we're working and don't necessarily think about it in that detail, which is so relevant for every patient that you have. So yeah, it was really great. Yeah, any questions uh, from anyone? I guess then what is blood pressure useful for in like what does it tell you i guess is something like is it does it tell you tissue perfusion or it's just a vague indicator like what 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 does it actually serve as a purpose and is the is the ultimate sort of thing that we're looking for um an actual measure of cardiac output or tissue perfusion which you know we don't really have easily accessible or at all well, we do have NIRs. We do have things like NIRs. And people are looking at things like transcutaneous oximetry. Or we can do jugular venous bulb, SATs, things like or, or central or mixed venous SATs. There are indicators, but none of them are perfect. I think that might, that might be what you're saying as well. As for utility of blood pressure, I think, uh, let me just go back to a slide that I might have skipped over too quickly. Yeah. Basically, yes, the perfusion pressure determines flow through an organ. Um, yeah, so it's... Here, yeah. so oxygen delivery to the tissues, which is all of them, is determined by the tissue blood flow multiplied by the oxygen content of the blood that's flowing through those tissues. Um, and tissue blood flow, this is, this is where Ohm's law is applied. 
the blood flow through the tissues is determined by the pressure on one side, that's the mean arterial pressure, the pressure on the other side, which is central venous pressure or right atrial pressure, and the resistance between those two locations, which is the systemic vascular resistance mostly provided by the arterioles. So blood pressure is, is the key determinant of, um, um, and of those things that we can measure easily, that blood pressure is, is, is the one, right? On, on the left-hand side, that's the terms of tissue blood flow. The one that we can most easily measure and modulate easily is, is mean arterial pressure. We can get more fluids, we can get more press source essentially. Um, so that is the determinant of tissue blood flow. Does that make sense? So yes, uh, cardiac output and tissue blood flow are the same because it's a closed circuit, blood flow in one direction uh, and one part of the circuit must be equal to a blood flow in another part of the circuit. I think that what's probably happened is that there would have been very clever people who came up with these equations and realized these complex, these complex ideas in the first instance. And over time, because it's been easier to plug in cardiac output instead of tissue blood flow because, well, I guess we can measure it sometimes. Um, and also it makes, it makes nice intuitive sense and we understand what cardiac output means. But I think this, this was probably the, the as, as for the uh, physiological purist, this might be the way to look at it. So maybe Stan or Lark can have a go because I've been talking a lot about the way I explain it, but maybe no, you guys can shed some more light on it. Uh, actually, I actually think that's really, really elegant. I mean, when, when I, I, I always tell, I, I think when I'm with trainees and I even telling myself, I guess, that we've only got a certain number of variables that we can measure. So, you know, we can measure stats and blood pressure and ECG and these, you know, give us some indicators, but they don't give us all of the answers. Uh, but but because we know a lot of the different patterns that have, you know, over, uh, you know, over 100 years of giving anesthesia, we know the patterns that result in health and not in health, we can know when those patterns are, you know, going, you know, array and you know, not, not, not quite right. That said, so, you know, we, I think before this talk, I would have told everyone, you know, blood pressure is a determinant of perfusion because it's, you know, just the pressure differential that means everything. But what we really want to know is the cardiac output to a certain tissue organ. And then my next statement would have been saying something like, I mean, you know, that's just a lot harder to measure. You, you need to get some invasive stuff. And even then you're not really measuring at the point of the tissue interface itself. So I think cardiac, you know, map, you know, map at the tissue level, really, really important. We can't necessarily measure it perfectly, perfectly there with the, uh, you know, we can't measure the r resistance of any one organ perfectly, but we can go a long way to estimate it. And we've got some, you know, not, not commonly used things like NERS and, and various um, cutaneous oximetry. Uh, cardiac output gets a little bit more interesting because you're now doing invasive, but again, not commonly used in most general anesthetic practice. Um, and yeah, I think, I think after this talk, I'm going to be far more kind to blood pressure because it really is, you know, it really is very useful <laughs> as a, the, you know, the, um, as a forward force across a tissue, a tissue bed. The other thing is that we know we know quite a lot about the autoregulation curves for these various organs. So we can't know exactly what the perfusion is like at a particular organ, but we can have a fair idea because we can measure the blood pressure very accurately. Mm -hmm. And we know what these autoregulation curves are. So we can, if we can get the blood pressure in a particular range mm -hmm. uh, in which that, that organ is known to be happy, um, I think example, that's, that's, yeah. that's a very achievable thing to do. We just can't remember, we can't be measuring the... Um, the adequacy of oxygen delivery directly with as much ease. Now, so what I think, um, yeah, I think you you really described it very elegant, ele elegantly in that uh, picture, you know, that Lord of the Rings picture um, for me, where I think for blood pressure for me, especially with anesthesia has to do, I think, and last sort of touched on it, it has to do with, you know, the perfusion in literally the heart and the brain, and then pretty much everything else, you know, gets reduced. And I, and I, and I think you, you sort of nailed it when you say, when you said that an increase in your blood pressure does not always mean that you're increasing cardiac output. I, and I think that that should resonate with everyone here is that yes, they are related, but there are other factors in play. And yes, certainly, you know, one of the ways that you can inc increase blood pressure is to give more volume, but often, you know, in anesthesia, the reason why we use vasopressors is often because of um, you know the drugs that we use, which cause vasodilation, and so we we use vasopressors to counteract that. But there will be, I think, you know, some other scenarios where vasopressors may not be the appropriate um, you, you know, mode of uh, treatment to treat someone's uh, hypotension. 
yeah i think yeah this slide here is is excellent i, I really like this one uh stuart mm -hmm. i also think of that case where you've got the um, patient for pneumoperitoneum and you know a common question might get asked is you know what are the effects of pneumoperitoneum on the cardiovascular system and you know that, that's actually a really complex complex question because not only do you have the variables of how much pressure you apply to the pneumoperitoneum and the sympathetic activity that that causes but then you also have to keep in mind the patient's existing cardiac and vascular state. And so if you think of, you know, giving Stuart here a pneumoperitoneum of a normal level of 10 to 15, you might actually get an increase in cardiac output because not only is his volume state good, but you might increase preload, therefore venous return, which is the ultimate determinant of cardiac output, but also his heart is healthy and can cope with it. And then you take the other extreme. I had a, you know, severe pulmonary hypertension patient um, a few months ago, which was, you know, systolic pressures of over 80 and um you know palmary systolic pressures of over 80 <clears throat> and i was thinking oh this pneumoperitoneum this is definitely going to be on the realm of if we have high pneumoperitoneal pressures not only will we have a high sympathetic charge but uh, you'll have a decrease in your um, preload because the pressures are going to need to be necessarily high for this patient in this complicated surgery but also the heart just isn't functioning uh, you know, with, with this really decreased ejection fraction as well. So, you know, when I, when I think of all those complexities again, uh, yeah, it, there's, there's so, there's so many aspects to think about and that's kind of what a, what a whole job is recognizing these patterns. Hey, hey, Stu, I was going to ask you, do you use, uh, ephedrine much? I, I didn't used to, cause I, I guess I find the variable response to the drug very annoying, but I think it has yeah. its uses. <laughs> Uh, and and, and, it's, and I think it's such an yeah it's such an interesting drug because you're absolutely right I and and I wonder whether it has to do with you know this whole theory that uh, you know with blood pressure it's it's more than just um, you know an increase in contractility because and, and you know I've been sort of thinking about this idea that you know with ephedrine it's got very weak uh, peripheral vasoconstricting activity and most of its effects are centrally on the heart itself and you know supposedly meant to increase contractility but you know there's that idea where you can you can increase contractility as much as you want but if you don't actually have the increase in your venous return it doesn't actually increase your cardiac output by that much more like wh what are your what are your thoughts on all that oh sure i mean i i feel like in clinical practice we tend to use it when the rate is too low so there's hypertension yep. and bradycardia um yeah that's when an, in an increment in heart rate actually makes a big difference to a patient's blood pressure. I'm thinking the patient that we had a, couple, a week ago that was just like that. Um, I don't think of it as being an inotrope as such. I mean, I know it's doing that, but that's not the setting in which I'd be pulling it out, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, but you, you're right. You need to have a preload to pump anything. This is one of the, yeah. the, the, the key lessons in cardiovascular physiology for the primary. I think it's something that they talk about a lot in, Looks like power and cam and papano and so on. Yeah. Is, is it also a thing? Um, as you mentioned, you know, it has this weak effects. So you you give you a three, you give another three, and maybe a six, and then you know maybe the heart is pumping a little bit harder, but the vascular system is still weak. Then you give a little bit of aramine, and suddenly the blood pressure goes up to yeah. two hundred. <laughs> yeah. So something I, it's, I, I it's definitely a boost. Like what about like a, a little bit of atropine plus your metaraminol? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That probably it likes more but then efficacious. It's, it's and, a little bit unpredictable too. There seems to be a, an amount of which, yeah, there's no effect, and all of a sudden the heart rate's I was going to say I much prefer glyco and uh, metaminol, but sure. uh, yes, I, I, I agree. I just didn't. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> gentle, 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 yeah. gentle. I get really um, it gives me a real kick if I give just the right amount of atropine to make the heart rate go from forty to seventy. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, that was good. And uh... <laughs> not a good one. <laughs> um, does anyone else have any questions at all that they want to ask, uh, Stuart? I do. If no one else wants to jump in, yeah, go for it, Al. It's probably a simple one. I'm just trying to, going back to that first kind of example that you made, which is if someone arrests, they still have a blood pressure. Mm. Just, so what's, does that mean that when someone arrests their blood pressure, is their mean systolic filling pressure? That's where it falls eventually. Once 
the blood is equilibrated. It's found its natural resting place in both the arteries and veins at a pressure which, which is equal on both sides of the circulation. Right at the moment of cardiac arrest, the patient's still conscious. So you probably heard of things like cough CPR, so patients actually can stay conscious and, um, and pump blood around their circulation that way. So I think that there might perhaps is, is that, can you, can you repeat your question? Just see if I can answer it any better. I know, it's, I think it was just me trying to understand what mean um, filling mean pressure systemic, is. Systemic filling pressure. Um, and and that is that the pressure that's left over when flow ceases? And then does that mean that yeah. flow let me, let me is involved in blood pressure? <laughs> So yeah, um, adenosine is a good example to, to, to flesh this one out. So we give adenosine, there is cardiac standstill, there is still a blood pressure, the patient's still awake enough to say, oh my goodness, what did you just give to me? And then the blood passes from the arteries into the veins. At the moment, say the blood pressure on the arterial side is, I don't know, mean of 100, on the venous side, it's mean of uh, CVP is what, five, two. And then the blood passes from the arteries to the veins because the arteries are so much more muscular and they don't have as much capacity to take up blood as what the veins do. The veins are extraordinarily distensible. And so we have uh, eventually end up with a patient who is essentially in cardiac arrest if the, if the asystole goes on for long enough. They've got arteries which are, well, they're not empty, but there's the ratio of blood in the arteries to veins is one to 20. There is no flow anywhere in the circuit, which means that the pressure is the same everywhere in the circuit. Agree. So if there's no flow, there is pressure equilibration. Mm -hmm. That pressure is also derogatorily called dead dog pressure because that's what Arthur Garten was up to, a brilliant physiologist that he was. Um, that pressure is, gen I think it's said to be about seven or is it seven to 12 millimeters of mercury? That's what okay. mean systemic filling pressure is. It's not a concept that is relevant to our patients except in the arrested setting, but it describes the pressure to which Mean up, well, it describes the equilibration pressure in the setting that cardiac arrest is allowed to continue or remain. And is that just generated by the, the constant smooth muscle tone of the vasculature? Yeah, the blood in and the pipes and the stretchiness of the pipes. Okay. And then, and then any pressure on top of that is generated by cardiac output, essentially. Yes. Is that a way of sort of thinking about it? Yeah. Does that make okay? Because that sort of, if you said sort of determinants of blood pressure, then I could say yes, this stretching for the pipes, cardiac output. Um, and I'm just trying to think how I'd answer that question. Yeah. So it's it's still true. It, the blood pressure is still determined by the amount of blood in the pipes and the stretchiness of the pipes. But when we have an intact circulation, the heart is trying very hard to keep a decent amount of blood in the arteries so that we can raise a pressure that perfuses the tissues at a rate that we're happy with. Okay. Yeah. So thank yes, you. The increment in, in arterial volume is dependent upon the cardiac output and obviously the systemic vascular resistance. So a bit of a thought experiment. Let's say your heart stands still and you just give someone a lot of noradrenaline. You could have quite a high blood pressure. Uh, you just wouldn't have any circulation. Yeah. So if you've got, an in, if you've got no aortic insufficiency yes. and you've got arteries, arterials which are closed, well, I guess you'd have flow for a little while to your important organs. Yes, for a little while, and then it, essentially there would be no more oxygen because there's no pass in the lungs. But for you'd 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 have whatever number, you know, two three minutes of. Uh, that's what's really possible. Yeah, that's right. Uh, actually, actually, there's a counter argument to that because um, when we let's say you're at standstill and you give uh, a you know a lot of noradrenaline, your mean your mean systemic filling pressure uh, is based on really your venous compliance because essentially if no if let's say no adrenaline primarily just works on the arterial side and just squeezes your arterial side it just all goes to the venous side and it, it, it works on the venous side as well though yeah uh yeah but but I, I guess i guess i guess uh not as much but and yeah you know well if if it does then yes you would definitely see an, an increase in your mean systemic filling pressure that way um but uh you know, I think that the primary way is to sort of shift your mean systemic filling pressure is yeah, through, either through venal constriction or through an increase in your blood volume. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any other questions? 
Um, Stan, just, just going to that one again, just, I'm just thinking about the, um, the vascular curve. And when you increase the SVR, it just pivots on itself. It doesn't increase the mean systolic filling pressure. Yeah. Just that's volume. A, that's a, correct. That's a really good point. So there's, there's a difference between uh, vasoconstriction and venoconstriction. And, yep. and its effects on the vascular function curves. So when, so when we talk about vasoconstriction, uh, we, we talk about um, systemic vascular resistance. When we talk about venoconstriction, we talk about you know, recruitment of uh, blood from like, let's say the splenic circulation to actually increase your blood volume. And so when, when you think about things that, that will shift your vascular function curves, um, anything that increases your blood volume, as in through either um, transfusions or either through recruitment from venoconstriction and anything that pivots your, your vascular function curves, uh, anything that affects your arterial side of compliance, so anything like you know, your vasoconstrictors that affect afterload, okay, or vasodilation from anesthetic drugs. Does, does that make sense? Um, yeah, so the venoconstriction thing, I understand in terms of recruiting... Um, blood, you know, from the liver or the spleen or something, is that to do then with venoconstriction more than it's arterial constriction? Like, Correct. Correct. Okay. That's right. Correct. Yes. And then, but I guess on that, you would still also see, you know, you have an increase in uh, venous return then and then an increase in cardiac output on that same curve. Is that because the intersection now has just um, moved up the curve because there's now a the um the so I can't even remember what it yeah was. <laughs> yeah because the whole thing shifted right correct that's right so i think okay. you know when, when we talk when we talk about things that increase your blood volume we think about things that will shift the curve to the right oh, um but then when we when we think about things that are vasoconstrictors it actually pivots it down okay so will be down like this. So as, as in, we're assuming that this would be a, um, a vasoconstrictor, okay? But, but, it, but if you think about drugs that are veno and vasoconstrictors, this, this would be a really interesting one to think about. So it shifts it to the right and then it pivots it, pivots it down to represent the increase in um, afterload. But ultimately for a given right atrial pressure, so let's say you're, you're about up here, you still will have an increase in your cardiac output or venous return. I mean, I think that's a, that's a really interesting point to sort of think about, to just sort of discuss with drugs that are both vaso and venoconstrictors. I mean, Stuart, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Which is your starting curve there, Stan? Can you bring that page up again? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, so my starting curve is, uh, yeah. is this no, I agree uh, with what one. you said. You increase the blood volume, you shift the curve to the right. Uh, yep. You increase the systemic vascular resistance, you rotate the curve, to the left with the fulcrum yes. at the um, MSFP, which is the X, the MFSP, the, uh, yep. X intercept. Which is here. Uh, yep. Um, but I, I recall reading in Papano that when you give what we call vasoconstrictors, they're actually vasoconstrictors and venoconstrictors because there are lots of um, alpha one receptors on the capacitance vessels because that's that's why yep. the capacitance vessels are there. Of course, is for when they're needed in the you know, for an emergency. So when you give a vasoconstrictor, you don't actually rotate the curve like that because all of our drugs do both vasoconstriction and venoconstriction. I think it tends to be more of a shift to the right because um, constricting the capacitance vessels as far as the left ventricles are concerned is the same thing as transfusing blood. And, and just, all of those just so that increase um, the flow of yeah. blood towards the heart. And, and just so everyone can see um, what you sort of like, well, how you think about this. Um, hey, like, can you, can you, can you put up the whiteboard so that, uh, everyone can see what Stuart's um, idea is in terms of how it differs from from what I think happens. I think that that would uh, that okay. be really I'll, interesting. To I've got to draw. This this is a bit terrifying. <laughs> uh, I don't think I disagree with anything you said, particularly Stan. But if this is um, oh oh no no, I mean just just an uh, adaptation. Yeah yeah yeah. How do I? I think it's I think it's I think it's great to have these because uh, I think it's such an interesting idea and interesting discussion point. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to do the uh, whiteboard on this. I think it's. Oh, can you can you can you click share screen and then just click on whiteboard? Oh, got it. Under your. If I would say one thing about these curves, I think they're useful conceptually to understand what how the circulation works, um, but they're not necessarily 
these curves aren't necessarily applicable to a particular intervention. I mean, yes, with the yes. circulation is all connected. It's the song. It's the song that never ends. Um, yes. And when we increase the cardiac output, you actually you increase the amount of blood in the arteries, and therefore you increase the the heart determines its own afterload, which is a weird thing to say. Um, so there. And uh, as I was saying before, you um, so that's a normal curve. Say. Yep. If we increase the systemic vascular resistance, we rotate the curve downwards because it makes it harder for the heart to pump. If we transfuse the patient, then it looks like this. Just a translation shift to the right. Yep, pretty much. If we do what we do in real life, which is to give a vasoconstrictor, vena constrictor in the one mm. drug, I think that essentially does the same thing, which is shifted to the right. Maybe it shifts it down a little bit. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. my best guess would be it probably looks a little like the curve on the right because All right. Okay. when you constrict capacitance vessels, the main effect I think is to increase the, um, the venous return to the heart. Sorry, Stuart, I don't think that's particularly um, different think, to what you said, Stan, but I don't have an answer for what happens when we give a vasoconstrictor vena constrictor. Sorry, Stuart, I think you moved a little bit away from the microphone. All my sound's just not oh. fabulous. What was your second, what did you say your oh, yeah. second graph so where it shifted my, down was representing? Can you, so you can, you can hear me now and you can see my little yes, pointer. Yes, can. Can yes. you see a little, yeah, so that's, this is our, I guess, normal curve here. Baseline. Yeah. Yep. If you increase the systemic vascular resistance, then you rotate downwards and your fulcrum, which is the rotation point, is here. That's your MSFP. Is That's what the exit decept is. So you reduce venous return down to zero. So venous return... So are you zero. arguing that that's a vena constrictor? If you're, if you're increasing the SVR, are you arguing that's also a vena constrictor? So what I'm saying is if you were to find a drug which were an arterial vasoconstrictor only, because they don't exist, yeah. this is what it would look like, this one here. If you transfuse the patient... It looks like this. If you give a drug that which we actually have, which is vasoconstrictor and venoconstrictor in the one drug, I'm not sure what it looks like. I think it pretty much looks like this one. Maybe it will be this one, but also rotated down a little bit. I'm not sure. I need to check on that. Okay. And, what, and why is it now. the why is it a shift right and not a shift in the fulcrum? Is it because you've like, because if you um your mean systemic filling pressure is what happens when you arrest the heart, you let equilibration happen, and blood pressure is determined by nothing more than, as what we said before, the volume of blood in the pipes and the stretchings of the pipes. In the case where we transfuse the patient, the patient has more blood in the pipes now. So the arrest, the arrest, the cardiac arrest pressure across the circulation will be higher than what it was before the patient was transfused. There's more blood in the pipes. It's as simple as that. Such, such an interesting another one of these discussion. On yeah. <laughs> You know, this goes back to the idea, I think, where we, where we, where we talk about, um, you know, the use of vasoconstrictors, but an increase in blood pressure does not always, in, does not always result to an increase in um, cardiac output. Yeah. So I think, that, so I think, uh, well, it, you know, it only, that, an increase in cardiac, well, an increase in cardiac output happens with an increase in blood pressure, only if the cause is an increase in cardiac output. If you're giving a vasoconstrictor, yep. that always reduces cardiac output. Yep. Yep. Agree. Agree. Yeah. Agree. yeah. Agree. Um, no, I, for, I, I, I think it's super interesting. Hmm. As for vasoconstrictors, oh, also always... venoconstrictors, um, surely other people have noticed this too. If you have a bowl of suppressor through a little drip, you notice that the, the flow rate through the drip reduces temporarily. The, it starts dripping a lot more slowly. Am I the only person who's ever seen that? You, know, you give you a I've never noticed that. <laughs> Oh, oh goodness. Isn't because the venous system has gone yeah, up yeah. in pressure. I, well, you know, the, the vein into which you're given the drug is now constricted. Oh, that's so interesting. Wow. <laughs> oh, sure I've seen that. I'm going to maybe I'm going to I'm going to have to I'm going to have to experiment on this the next time. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> it's not in a, not in a free flap list. Or well, or if you <laughs> or if you give um you know metaraminol, it might give a milligram and uh, the blood pressure goes up a bit and the cardiac uh, and the end tidal CO2 just jumps down three points. And so you're thinking, oh, I think I just decreased cardiac output because I increased my afterload with that and slowed my heart rate down with the baroreceptor reflex. And uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, that's such a good, I think, I think we'll have to YouTube uh, that one live, uh, Stuart. We'll have to, yeah, that's right. We'll, uh, I'm going to 
give give metronome to my next patient and and see what happens to the flow rate on the venous side. That's great. That's a great experiment. <laughs> hey Stan, so that's got to about over, over an hour. And uh, it, I mean, does anyone have any other pressing questions before we close out? Pressing questions. Great turn of phrase. Um, I think it, it's asked with vasopressors, does your venous capacitance decrease as well as your total SVR? Um, yeah, yes. I think that's what uh, we were discussing is that your venous capacitance uh, decreases, but your, your SVR should increase with vasopressors. Okay. And it's quite interesting, you know, with, with um, the, I mean, we'll talk about, we'll, talk, we'll have to talk about this on another, on another, se on another uh, session, but the idea of systemic vascular resistance and total peripheral resistance, I know that they use it um, interchangeably. And I, I noticed today that you used uh, systemic vascular resistance, but, but I guess where the confusion I think sometimes lies is that why do people use total peripheral resistance as opposed to systemic vascular resistance? It might be, I mean, they kind of mean the same thing. I suppose total peripheral resistance might be seen to include both the arterial and the venous resistance because there will be some resistance of flow conferred by the veins, but they're much bigger vessels. Um, the pressure gradient required to pass blood from one point to another in a vein is not so great as what it is in the arteries. So I think that functionally, they're probably not that different because the resistance is really all at the arterioles. Is that, is that what you might understand about it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, um, and, I, and I think that's why there's always that source of confusion is that, you know, when people talk about SVR, they, they're thinking just on the arterial side. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, when they talk about, but, but it's not, you're right. It's, I think it's inclusive of the whole um, arterial primarily, and also the venous side, which as you said before, is about one, you know, it's got one twentieth that of um, the resistance of the arterial side. Excellent. I think uh, it's probably good for a session. All right. Thanks very much, Lara. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So, thanks for everyone for tuning in. Thanks so much, Stuart. That was Thank just you. incredibly, incredibly useful. And as, as always, um, yeah, share this with anyone who might be interested. And uh, we'll see you for the next episode. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks.